We'll worship now by hearing how the Spirit might speak to us through God's Word. First, from James 1, verses 22 and 23. Don't fool yourself into thinking that you are a listener when you are anything but letting the Word go in one ear and out the other. Act on what you hear. Those who hear and don't act are like those who glance in the mirror, walk away, and two minutes later have no idea who they are and what they look like. Anyone who sets himself up as religious by talking a good game is self-deceived. This kind of religion is hot air and only hot air. And now from Matthew 5, verses 14 and 16, Jesus says to his disciples and to all of us, you are the light of the world. Let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Well, a Catholic man is running late to work in New York City. When he decides to make a mad dash across a very busy Manhattan street, he is almost home free, but alas, he meets up with the front of a bus just before he's about to hit sidewalk pay dirt. He's lying near death on the curb as a crowd gathers. A priest Somebody get me a priest, the man gasps. Minutes drag on. No one steps out of the crowd. A policeman scans the crowd again, says with even more urgency, a priest, please, isn't there a priest in the crowd to give this man his last rites? Well, out of the crowd steps a little old man. Mr. Policeman says the man, I'm not a priest. I'm not even a Christian. But for 50 years, I've been living behind the Catholic Church on First Avenue. Every night, I overhear their services. I can recall almost all that is spoken during their liturgy. Maybe I can be of comfort to this man. The policeman agrees. He clears the crowd out so the man can get through. And the old man kneels down and leans over the dying man and says in a very solemn voice, Be Five, I nineteen, N thirty eight, G twenty eight. It's bad. I know it's bad. Thirty six months ago, I didn't have a priest or even a wannabe priest to call my bingo card. I had a banker. Greg Owen is his name. Truth be told. I have never laid eyes on the man, though he has laid eyes and hands on me. Three years ago, this past Thursday, I lay dead in a parking lot, although lay dead is probably not the most accurate descriptor. Slumped dead might be better. In the milliseconds after dropping off my white polo button-down at the Medlin Davis dry cleaners in Raleigh, My big old heart gave out from the strain of trying to pump blood to my big old body, and I slumped over my steering wheel, my car drifting into traffic. Bless his paying attention heart, Greg Owen, who was in the car behind me in line, in short order, sped around with his car to the front of my Jeep, used his car to stop my car, broke my passenger side window in order to unlock my doors, ran to my driver's side door, laid me flat, started CPR, and screamed inside for a defibrillator and for someone to call 911. He shocked me. EMS was there in two minutes, transported me to Wake Medical Center. En route, they had to bring me back twice. At Wake Med, they cooled my body so as not to fry my brain because of the systemic stress on my entire system. For six days, I lay in a coma, suspended, if you will, between this world and the next. 
My heart stopped on Super Bowl Sunday. My eyes opened for the first time the following Friday. Three days later, they wheeled me down the hall for the one, two, three bypasses you're out at the old ball game <laughs> surgery. <laughs> Curious friends and family and strangers have consistently asked me over the last three years all the questions you might imagine. Did you see the light? Honestly, I have no memory whatsoever from January 29th, which is the day before my birthday, and we had two parties for my birthday, through February the 7th. The only thing I remember is in the middle of my coma, I had a Jimi Hendrix purple haze dream from whatever I was on. They asked me, did you see Jesus? I did, but not how you think I did. I saw Jesus wearing doctor scrubs and nurse's scrubs. I saw Jesus in a nursing assistant tending wounds. I saw Jesus in my family, in my friends, as they kept vigil in the waiting room. And because I looked into the abyss between the now and the not yet, I think I have a unique vantage point on the things that truly matter. They are the things on which I want to reflect for just a minute around this table today, a reflection on reflections, if you will. I love how Eugene Peterson renders James 1 in the message that you just heard. Don't fool yourself into thinking that you're a listener when you are anything but. Act on what you hear. Those who hear but don't act are like those who glance in the mirror, walk away, two minutes later have no idea who they are and what they look like. In other words, James says, pay attention to your reflection. Better put, pay attention to what you are reflecting. You are the light of the world, Jesus says in Matthew 5. So reflect already. Let your light shine so others may be guided to see and to glorify God. Reflection, remembrance, was very much on the mind of the Messiah the evening that he instituted this meal. As the disciples sat around the table the night of the Last Supper, Frederick Buechner says, Jesus wanted to get all he was feeling said while there was still time, and to get it said right. Jesus understood that we so often don't understand how precious this supper is, how precious these friends are that we are sitting down with this morning. The sadness really is that we don't see that every supper with them is precious beyond all telling. Every Supper with them is precious beyond all telling. I told you all a few weeks ago my word for 2023 is light. Among the many reasons I adore this word, two particular issues stick out today. Light doesn't make noise. We don't need more noise here at Community Church which leads to reason number two. We need light shed on what ultimately matters. And what ultimately matters is this. Your relationship with God, your relationship with those closest to you, and your capacity to let light shine in this world, not in this church, but in this world, Jesus says, you are the light of the world, not the light of the church, period. Given all that we've been through in this last six months, I smiled wryly and knowingly and approvingly when I read these words this week from my friend and colleague, James Howell, who's the senior minister at Myers Park United Methodist Church in Charlotte. I think I smiled big because I can echo 
every single word he wrote. As a pastor, he writes, I get to spend a much higher than uh, average amount of time with people who are sick and in various levels of distress. Notice I said, get to. Every now and then, some parishioner expressing concern for me will say, man, I don't know how you do your job. I'd burn out after a few years of watching people suffer up close. But this well-intended thought, he says, couldn't be more wrong. I may burn out one day, but it will be because of small-minded people who feel some obligation to nitpick and to grouse about trivialities, those combative sorts who keep everyone in the church bent out of shape over one insignificant budget item, or what color the carpet should be in the parlor, to be with any person in their hour of chaos, to pull up a chair and hold the hand of someone who is digesting frightening news from the oncologist, to sit late at night with the family as they concede that there is little time left, to listen to tender words, to offer a tissue to help wipe away tears blackened by makeup, to hug someone who is trembling, to overhear defiant words of hope, that is the part of the life of a minister I would not live without. That is the privilege. As a pastor, I get to see the nobility of humanity, to be there when words that matter are spoken. Grown children kiss their father, perhaps for the first time since turning eight. Or nine, friends dispense of more polite verbiage and say simply, I love you. The words that matter are spoken. Can I ask you a question? Are they being spoken in your life? They matter so much more than you know which is why I want to take just a second to reflect for a moment as I remember Kevin. It was 36 years ago when I met Kevin Moore, two days after I was hired as the youth director at Wesley Memorial Methodist Church in Wilmington. Kevin was a student at Laney High School a wrestler, dashing, a ladies' man, equal parts big-hearted kid, and mischief maker. He and his best buddy, Scott Aiken, would stop by my office at the church to chat, to listen to music. If they were really desperate, they'd ask for advice on dating. Kevin could have gone to any one of a number of colleges after he received some scholarship offers, but he felt drawn to the Marine Corps. He knew he would benefit from the structure. He loved the thought of this brotherhood that ran so deep that these people were willing to die for each other after 13 weeks of basic training. It felt like his calling. He left right after Christmas, 1988, headed for Paris Island. Seven weeks in, he blew out his knee, headed home, honorably discharged. His hope was hijacked, and when he came by my office soon after he returned, his eyes told me all I needed to know. The light was gone, dimmed irretrievably because of that moment that all of you, all of us, know so viscerally. What do I do when the dream that I believe was given to me by God meets its demise on the jagged rocks of reality? We talked fairly often in the days and weeks that followed. I remember like it was yesterday, the words that he spoke to me on May 6th, 1989. Thanks for all your help, Big Bob. I'm just not sure I'm worth it. But you are, Kev, I said, to me and to God. Three days later, my phone rang on a Saturday morning, 5 o'clock. Meet me at the Moore's house, my senior pastor said. Kevin ran into the back of a parked tractor trailer on the side of Interstate 40. 
the state trooper found our church bulletin in the wreckage. He wants us to meet him at the Moore's house to break the news to Ron and Sandy. At 6.15, we walk to a front door to break the news no parent should ever have to hear. At 8.15, I told Kevin's friends, those moments are forever, ever imprinted in my heart. Kevin was for me what I call a balcony person. I mean that in a couple of ways. The great Baptist preacher Carlisle Marney says that we all have balcony people. They're the ones who stand up and cheer us on from the balcony of life, speaking words of encouragement to keep us going. Kevin did that for me, but he was also a balcony person in another sense, in that I always felt like I couldn't quite reach him with the truth, that he was loved, that he was valuable, that he was of supreme worth. He only saw brokenness. Really, in most of the ways that matter, Kevin Moore is why I do this work. I mean, let's be honest. I do it for God. I do it for our awesome staff. I do it for the money. But sometimes, y'all, when everything and everyone gets crazy, I stop and think about Kevin. I appreciate all your help, Big Bob. I'm just not sure I'm worth it. I've counseled with untold numbers of folks. Feel like they weren't good enough, that their sins were too big to forgive, that their relationships were beyond repair or redemption. And out of all those experiences and a million more like them, out of God's work in my own life, here's why I do what I do. So I can say to everyone who's beaten down and broken and despairing and defeated and disappointed, I serve a Savior who says, make no mistake about it. You are so worth it. I thought of Kevin a lot over the last three years. I've made a career out of reminding folks out of what's important and what's not and how often we get both of those things so incredibly wrong. I've tried for 30 plus years to talk about treasuring time, pushing people towards a deep understanding of their worth to God, their worth to each other, their worth to this world. That hasn't changed, but I think I have. Before February 2nd, 2020, I was a wise observer of life and the promises of God. And after February 2nd, I became an active participant in them. There is an urgency within me to make sure my people know how deeply they're loved, how that love frees them up for any number of possibilities to forgive themselves, to forgive others, to step out of a past that plagues them, to know in this life, the abundant life of which Jesus speaks in John 10, to quit complaining over spilled champagne and to live into a calling that begins and ends right where your feet are. I want my people, all of you, to live like you matter, to get you to concentrate on the things that truly matter, to know hope when things seem hopeless. What Jesus is trying to communicate in this Last Supper is what I'm trying to communicate today. When I woke up from my coma, the second card I read was from one of my longtime Edenton Street church members and friends, a lady by the name of Ann Faust, whose father was a legendary bishop in the United Methodist Church, Ken Goodson. He presided in Alabama over the time of segregation and then integration in the late 50s and early 60s. She wrote in that card the words to her favorite hymn, which we sang at Edenton Street my second Sunday there. At the end of the service that day, Anne was wiping away tears. She was sobbing 
when I walked down the aisle to shake hands. Are you okay? I whispered as she hugged me tight. She unfolded for me her experience with that hymn. Her only son, Greg, had died at age four. Several carloads of Bishop Goodson's clergymen made the drive from Alabama to Winston-Salem, North Carolina, to mourn with the family. When it came time for them to leave, they formed a collective embrace, a circle around Anne and her husband, Larry. And throughout the walls of her house, throughout the hallways of her heart, an a cappella promise echoed as they sang, this is my father's world. Oh, let me ne'er forget that though the wrong seems off so strong, God is the ruler yet. Anne's words took me back 33 years when those very words were sung as I walked down the aisle to offer the eulogy for Kevin Moore. In a packed sanctuary, mourning teenagers, we had the audacity to say, though the wrong seems off so strong, God is the ruler yet. It's a promise that made all the difference in Ann Faust's life, in Kevin Moore's family's life, in my life. It's a promise that can make all the difference in your life. Though the wrong seems off so strong, God is the ruler yet. But you have to chase it like your life depends on it, because it does. My all-time favorite closing story took place during my high school years in Florida. My best friend's dad used to love to go to the dog races near our house in Orlando at the Seminole County Dog Track. My best friend Troy and I used to go sit with his dad there, watching adults gamble away their hard-earned money as they bet on which greyhound was going to out-sprint the other great hounds to get to the finish line. I got to know a racing dog there once, a dog named Gus. Day after day, Gus lined up on the track, all those other greyhounds at his side. At the start of each race, the gun went off. Off the dogs flew, round the oval, towards the wire, chasing a mechanical rabbit. One day... Out of the blue, Gus called it quits, just like that. I didn't know him all that well, but as luck would have it, because of my connections through a mutual friend, I got invited to his retirement party. And I got a chance to talk to him as the party started to wind down. Gus was sitting there, looking very dapper, little beret on his head, Dos Equis nestled in his paw, and I said to him, hey, most interesting dog in the world, I am curious. Do you miss the glitter, the excitement of the track? Not really, he said. Well, what was the matter? Did you get too old to race, I asked. No, Gus said, I still had a lot of race left in me. Well, what then? Did you not win? I won over a million dollars for my owner, Bob, he said. Well, what was it, man? Bad treatment? <coughs> no, said my friend Gus. They treated me royally when I was racing. Well, did you get hurt? Nope. Why did you retire? I quit, he said. You quit? Yeah, I just quit. Well, why did you quit? <laughs> I asked a bit impatiently. And that's when Gus the Greyhound leaned over at me and looked in my eyes and said, 
I quit the day I discovered that what I was chasing was not really a rabbit. It's funny. I spent all of my life running and running and running and running. And what I was chasing wasn't even real. <laughs>